all to join us. So to those of you who are already in the Zoom, good evening and welcome to this special event hosted by the Johannesburg Holocaust, I mean, um, the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation in partnership with the Goethe Institute, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, as well as the Bet David. Uh, we are thrilled and honored to, to welcome all of you to this special commemoration of the November pogrom, uh, also known as Kristallnacht. Um, we, today, we remember the, the victims and also the survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, so to, any, to, to the survivors who are joining us today, welcome and thank you very much for being part of this special event. Uh, my name is Mdun Duli, and I'm from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Um, it is a pleasure for all of us to welcome you tonight. Also, we are honored to have His Excellency German Ambassador um, Andreas Peschka. Ambassador Peschka, thank you also for being here with us. Um, also, um, we are honored to have Dr. Christopher Robert Browning, who will be the keynote speaker of tonight's event. So we are thrilled and honored to have you here, uh, Mr. Browning. Thank you very much. Um, also, tonight's event will be emceed, or the master of ceremony of tonight's event will be Francois Venter from the Goethe Institute. Um, so when we officially begin the event, I will then hand over to Mr. Venter, who will then proceed with um, being the, the master of ceremony. So for now, uh, I'm going to ask you to please be patient with us while we allow people into the Zoom. Uh, it will take quite a few minutes because we are expecting quite a large audience for tonight's event. So please be patient with us as our team allows people into the event. In the meantime, I would just like to share with you some few housekeeping guidelines that I would like you to remember throughout the event tonight. Please keep your sound on mute uh, throughout the event because we don't want any background noises that will interfere with tonight's presentation. So please make sure that your sound is on mute throughout the event. However, I do encourage you to use the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen, to communicate with us um, any questions or any comments that you might have or any difficulties. Yes, good morning. I'm calling in a- I, I'm going to have to ask you to please, uh, what a wonderful opportunity to remind you to please keep your sound on mute. Um, so how you do that, by the way, is at the bottom of your screen, there is a microphone image or there's a microphone icon. So if you click on that and there's a red dash across the icon, it means your sound is on mute, so we can't hear you. So please uh, make sure that that red dash is there across your microphone icon. Then you can speak and we won't be able to hear you. So thank you very much for that. Um, as I said, please keep your, please use the chat function to communicate with us. And also please be aware that this event is being recorded. So if you wish to hide your image from the world, please just again, press the video icon at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a red dash and then it means your video will be off. However, if you are happy to, uh, to keep your image on, on video, then it's fine, absolutely. You're welcome to do that. Um, let us take this opportunity to try and perhaps get to know one another by using the chat function. So I would like to ask you, those of you who've joined us already, can you please use the chat function just to let us know where you are joining us from, which, city or which country you're joining us from, um, just by writing on the chat the name of the city. It's always wonderful for us to know uh, how many countries are represented at such events and how many cities are represented at such events. So please just let us know where you're joining us from. And then when we are ready to begin, I will then hand, hand over to my colleague, Francois, who will then be your master of ceremony for tonight's event. Um, so we, as I said, we are ex expecting also an international audience. So we do have quite a, quite a number of people from all over this, from all over the world. We have Doreen from, from the UK who's joining us from London. Uh, we have Francis who's joining us from Jersey City, from the United States. 
Uh, we have Penelope who's joining us from Cape Town uh, in South Africa. Um, so quite a few people. We also have uh, Nai, I think if I pronounce it correctly, who's joining us from New York City uh, in the United States. And lastly, we have Sunet, who's joining us from Mossel Bay in South Africa. So thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, also for your continued support um, for these events. So on the night of 9 November 1938, government-led anti-Jewish violence erupted throughout the Reich um, in Germany, in Austria, and Sudetenland. These programs were staged as an unplanned outburst of national anger over the assassination of um, um, a minor German embassy official in Paris. And then thereafter, in two days, over 1,400 synagogues were attacked and many were set on fire. And approximately 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Some 3,500 businesses were destroyed and looted. Jewish cemeteries, hospitals, schools, and homes were vandalized, and more than 100 Jewish people were killed. These programs became known as Kristallnacht. And every year on this day, we commemorate this event called Kristallnacht. So we are thrilled today to have Dr. Christopher Browning, who will be our keynote speaker. And we are also thrilled to, her, to have um, His Excellency German Ambassador, Andreas, um, the Honorable Andreas Peschka, who will also address us this evening. Tonight's Master of Ceremony will be Francois Venter from the Goethe Institute. Uh, so we are thrilled to be in partnership with the Goethe Institute once again. Um, it is now three minutes past 7 p.m. South African time. I'm going to wait two more minutes while we allow more people in. We are expecting a very, very, very large crowd this evening. Uh, so my name is Mdun Duli, and I'm joining you from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, which is part of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. With our sister centers in Durban, the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center, as well as the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. So those are the three um, centers that fall under the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. So we are thrilled. Um, to host tonight's event in partnership with the Goethe Institute, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and Beth David. So for those of you who've just joined us, I'll just uh, quickly repeat some of the, the housekeeping rules that I would like you to remember throughout tonight's event. Please make sure that your sound is on mute throughout the event so that we don't have any background noises that interfere with tonight's uh, presentation. However, I do encourage you to use the chat function to communicate with us. If you have any um, technical difficulties that would like to communicate with us, please uh, use the chat function to do so. And also please be aware that this event is being recorded. So if you wish to hide yourself from the recording, please just cut your video. However, if you are happy for your sound, for your image to be seen by the world, uh, you are most welcome to keep your, your video on. And also, um, I'll, for those of you who've just joined us, please tell us where you're joining us from. So I'm joining you from Johannesburg in South Africa. Could you please just use the chat function just to write down the name of the city and the country you are joining us from. It's always wonderful to know how many countries and cities are represented at our events. All right, it is now five minutes past 7 p.m. South African time. And I will now, it is my uh, privilege to hand over to our master of ceremony tonight, Mr. Francois Venter. So over to you, Francois. Thank you very much, Ndu. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Francois Venter, and I work at the Goethe Institute, which is the German Cultural Institute in Johannesburg. I work in the cultural programs department, and it has been my honor and pleasure to have been part of a tradition from of over 10 years now of an annual uh, commemoration together with the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. 
uh, and the German embassy, embassies of several other countries, and often, as with this year, also the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, so um, welcome to all of you to uh, a very special event. Um, I was looking at where everybody are logging in from before the event started, and I thought briefly about the symbology of sitting here. I am right now in the library of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Against the wall to my one side is an image of a survivor from the Rwandan Holocaust, uh, or, or genocide rather, of 1994, which was of course the same year in which uh, I suppose my people and Mdu's people uh, came to uh, uh, a reconciliation after a very difficult history in this country. We've got uh, the German ambassador here. We've got Professor Browning who will be delivering tonight's um, uh, 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 keynote speech. We have in the uh, guests list or guest cloud, I suppose you could say, amongst us tonight, several survivors from the Holocaust, their families, so a very special welcome to them too. And um, apart from uh, uh, His Excellency Ambassador uh, Peshka, we've also got diplomats from various other countries participating tonight. They are members of several museums and information centers. I feel I should uh, make a special notice at this point, uh, mention at this point, uh, the, uh, there's, there's, there's three sister organizations here in South Africa uh, uh, under the umbrella of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. And so we are also joined tonight by members of the Cape Town and the Durban uh, Holocaust Centers. And as I have said already, also some colleagues from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Uh, so, uh, very special welcome to all of you to this event. Um, it is most certainly a, a special privilege for the Goethe Institute as part of its very diverse cultural work in um, uh, Southern Africa to be part of this event. Um, I keep saying this event, uh, we are talking about the commemoration, the annual November camp commemoration of what is referred to in the German speaking world as the November pogrom. Um, and I suppose one could say in the, in the English speaking um, um, world as Kristallnacht. Um, our director, Klaus Krischok, who can uh, unfortunately not be with us this evening, uh, re remarked last year on the, the sensitivity around this event and even around the name, what is it to be called? In Germany, the word Kristallnacht was used in the, uh, the German press by Nazi sympathizing newspapers shortly after the event, which uh, to many people um, uh, makes it the, 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 the only real correct term to refer to it, but for, for reasons of sensitivity, uh, the, the, the phrase November pogrom is more often used in the German speaking world. But because this is the kind of event that bridges gaps and brings people from very diverse backgrounds together, we call our event the November pogrom or Kristallnacht commemoration event. So um, after that rather complex um, uh, uh, word of welcome to all of you. Um, I would like to start off our program by uh, introducing to you the choir of the Beit David um, uh, uh, Shul. Um, and they um, have for some years now, um, when possible, participated in this event with beautiful music. Uh, so uh, we're going to start the proceedings with a piece of music by the choir of the Beit David.
Thank you so much to Beit David. Your music touches me to the core of my being, and so I'm very pleased to say that uh, we'll be hearing more of the choir later this evening. It is now my honor to introduce His Excellency Andreas Peschke, the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany in South Africa, for a special address. Ambassador, over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Francois Venter. Um, good evening, um, Sunny Bonani, um, dear Talinates, um, dear Professor Browning, dear friends, guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, start with a special thanks to the Goethe Institute, um, to the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, um, and to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Uh, for convening this event tonight. I think it is a very important event on a very important date uh, in our history, in our German history, but <clears throat> in fact in international history as well. On the 9th of November in uh, 1938, um, this may sound a long time ago, it was in fact 84 years ago, but uh, what happened on this very day in the night of this day and in the day after this day actually is still with us and it has to be with us and has and needs to remain with us as well. On the evening of the 9th of November 1938, as has been mentioned, the Nazi rulers of fascist Germany organized an unprecedented wave of attacks on Jewish shops, enterprises, factories and synagogues. This terrible night became known euphemistically, Francois has mentioned it as the Reichskristallnacht, the night of broken glass, but in fact, it was a night of pogrom. These were days of pogrom, so they are rightfully called November pogroms. More than 400 German Jewish citizens were killed. Synagogues all over Germany were burned to the ground. And today we know that the terrible events of this night led to the Holocaust, the mass murder of over 6 million Jews in Europe, organized and perpetrated by Nazi Germany. This is why we need to remember this night, even after 84 years. 84 years. Horror, we must never forget a crime beyond words that must be a warning forever. To make sure that such an abom abomination of civilization never happens again. Some may say, yes, of course, it will never happen again. The German people learned its lesson from history. Yet, we see a worrying rise of anti semitism in Europe and also in Germany. We remember the outrageous attack on a synagogue in Halle, East Germany. <clears throat> And if you can believe the statistics, the free frequency of anti-Semitic incidents has actually not decreased. That is why it is important to remember. That is why we need to continued efforts from civil society, as well as from official representatives of Germany and of German society. As foreign office, we have just undertaken an initiative to honor and commemorate former colleagues who were persecuted by the Nazi regime on account of their faith, origin, parentage, political beliefs, sexual orientation, or worldview. Many of them were Jews. To remember them, there will be 50 Stolpersteine, that means memorial plaques in the ground with their names at the former seat of the foreign office on Wilhelmstraße in Berlin. It is an initiative driven by the current staff members themselves who delved into the archives to uncover the stories of persecution. I think it is a very good example of a living memory. The moral imperative from all this is never again. Crimes that took place on this very night 84 years ago must never happen again. Crimes like the Holocaust must be prevented forever. And it's our responsibility 
as the people who live today and who act today to do our part to make sure that they will not never happen again. In my opinion, this is the meaning of the commemoration tonight. And this is the enduring task we all have at hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. It is now my honor to introduce the director of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, Charlie Nates, for a historical message and a moment of silence. Thank you very, very much, uh, Francois. Thank you very much, Ambassador Peshke, for your first uh, engagement with our centers in, uh, in South Africa and with our audiences. Uh, it is uh, from Johannesburg that I am welcoming you all to our commemoration tonight. Uh, and it is heartwarming to see friends and colleagues from all around South Africa, but indeed from all around the world joining us today. Of course, special welcome to our Holocaust survivors that uh, continue to support our efforts in education uh, and memory. And today, the 9th of November, would have been the 95th birthday of our dear Holocaust survivor, Veronica Phillips, who sadly died in February. And every 9th of November, we always were together um, commemorating the sadness, of course, of Kristallnacht, but also celebrating her birthday. She is missed every day by all of us. As the chair of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, which is the association of the three independent Holocaust and Genocide centers in Cape Town, Durban and Johannesburg, it is an honor for me to start the proceedings of today's commemoration. Uh, I am the director of the Johannesburg Center, Mary Kluck, who is with us is the director of the Durban Center and Heather Blumenthal, uh, who is also with us is the director of the Cape Town Center. And I want to uh, welcome everyone for all their teams, our teams from all the three centers, including all members of our board of trustees as well. And it is a tradition that we work together with the Goethe Institute and Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and indeed with the German embassy for many, many years and with Beit David Choir. And we are uh, heartened that we can continue this tradition, even if it is on Zoom. And we are hopeful that next year it can happen also in person. Every year, the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation marks two dates uh, on the, if you wish, calendar of remembrance, of education, and of reflection on uh, the connections between the Holocaust and um, the present. Today, the 9th of November, we always commemorate and mark the November, November pogroms. On the 27th of January, Holocaust Remembrance Day, we always mark a general commemoration of the Holocaust, but actually the liberation of Auschwitz, the largest of the killing centers in concentration camps. So what was the path from January of 1933, when the Nazis took power in Germany, to the Holocaust and ultimately to the final solution, the genocide of the Jews and to Auschwitz. So we need to reflect, and today is a day of reflection. We need to reflect on how the Nazis used their extremist ideology, how they created a dictatorship, a totalitarian state, how they harnessed a legal system to implement this extremist ideology how they divided and ruled 
through fear and terror, not only in Germany, but throughout occupied lands. How they used sophisticated system of propaganda, propaganda, uh, fake news, if you wish, and how they use the power of educating the young to create this system, this mass killing that we call today the Holocaust. Within less than six years from taking control of Germany on the 9th and 10th of November, 1938, mass pogroms were implemented all around the then Reich, Germany, Austria, and the annexed parts of Czechoslovakia. Those pogroms against the Jews included destruction of thousands of homes, apartments, businesses, property, synagogues, but also mass violence, rape, killings, and arrests of ten, tens of thousands of Jewish men that were sent to concentration camps. Historians call it these pogroms, the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. Because the rest of the history of the Holocaust is of course very much known to all of you, to all of us present here today. It is well documented in the exhibitions of the three Holocaust and genocide centers in Cape Town, Durban and Johannesburg. In of, course, course, of course, if you join our That's weekly good. education programs in the centers oh. and online, you can also learn about these programs there. The Holocaust took place in full view of the world. Millions of people witnessed the crimes committed by the Nazis. Some chose to resist the regime while others collaborated. Some helped the victims while most were bystanders. Those choices were made by individuals who came from different countries and backgrounds and were motivated by different motives. They either supported or opposed Nazi, Nazi ideology, they were led by compassion or lack of compassion. They were greedy or they were afraid. They were maybe motivated by religious or moral principles. And while some actions could easily be identified with one choice or another. Others were ambiguous, or perhaps some moved from one choice to another. It is important to explore all those choices and dilemmas as they all had immense consequences for the victims. And today, we will look at one of those stories. Thank you. So today we will look at one of those stories, uh, a story of one that chose to help. Um, Professor Christopher Browning will explore one such individual and his choices and consequences. I hope that by doing that, we can invite you and myself to reflect and make connections to our world today, where the refugee crisis in all continents, in all countries almost in the world is the worst it has been since the Second World War and where hatred of the other is sadly again very much present from anti-Semitism to xenophobia to racism. It's all here yet again. 
So I would like us all to take a moment to reflect together on what brought us all together today. Yes, remembering the turning point of Kristallnacht, the November pogroms, but also its lessons and applications for today. May we take a moment of silence together. Thank you very much for thinking about these words uh, together and hopefully all of us will become people of action, uh, not only of words, but be part of making the world a better place through our choices and actions. Our esteemed guest speaker, Professor Christopher Browning, by the way, was invited uh, to be with us physically, in person, not only in 2020, but also this year in 2021. But sadly, because of the pandemic, of course, he could not make the trip uh, to South Africa. But uh, thank, I'm very grateful to him that he agreed to join us today as a teaser for next year, where he will hopefully join us in person in South Africa in November 2022. So, Thank you again uh, for all of you for coming, and I look very much forward to learn from you, Professor Browning, today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dali. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Browning, um, I've already betrayed my, my liking for this. The uh, David Choir are going to present a second piece of music to us, and then I will introduce Dr. Browning to you. Over to Pate David. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter David. Um, it's now my honor to introduce the keynote speaker of tonight, Dr. Christopher Robert Browning. 
Dr. Browning is the Frank Porter Graham Professor Emeritus of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. A specialist on Holocaust history, Dr. Browning is known for his work documenting the final solution, the behavior of those implementing Nazi policies, and the use of survivor testimony. He is the author of nine books, including Ordinary Men, 1992, and The Origins of the Final Solution, 2004. Dr. Browning taught at the Pacific Lutheran University from 1974 to 1999, and eventually became a distinguished professor. In 1999, he moved to the University of North Carolina to accept the appointment as Frank Porter Graham Professor of History, and in 26, uh, 2006, I mean, he was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. After retiring from the University of North Carolina in 2014, he became a visiting professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Browning has acted as an expert witness at several Holocaust-related trials, including the second trial of Ernst Zündel in 1988, and the infamous Irving versus Penguin Books Limited trial of 2000. Um, this evening, as um, Charlie has hinted, we will be told of a particular story from this history. And to be specific, it is the story of Tracy Strong Jr. and Le Chabon sur Lignon. The title of the address is from humanitarian relief to a holocaust rescue dr browning over to you thank you very much uh i'm very happy to uh, be visiting with you by long distance and as tally noted i hope very much that next year uh, i will be in south africa in person as Holocaust studies came of age in the 1980s, Raoul Hilberg suggested that uh, the study of the Holocaust could be divided into focusing on three different groups, uh, the perpetrators of the victims and the bystanders. Uh, the issue of the bystanders was, I think, the most difficult of those categories because, in effect, it stretched all the way from those who were the most uh, callous uh, parasites and beneficiaries of the persecution of the Jews on the one hand, to those uh, who risked everything to help them. And so it made sense eventually to in effect create a subfield of study of Holocaust rescuers. Uh, and that has become uh, a, a focal point, I think, within the wider study of Holocaust uh, that uh, has gained momentum over the last decades. Even that field, Holocaust rescue, I think has uh, at least four different uh, points of, of focus. One is those who focus on the international aspect of rescue, or in some cases, the lack of rescue. What did FDR and the American government do? What did Pope uh, Pius uh, XII and the Vatican do? What did Great Britain do or not do? Uh, and often, in fact, uh, the study of international rescue has been the study of the lack of international rescue. It has been, in a sense, a kind of accusatory study. Uh, in which uh, the failure uh, of powers outside of Europe uh, to do the maximum uh, and usually do the minimum in terms of uh, what could have uh, been done in hindsight. A second focus is on uh, sort of the national focus. And of course here, Denmark is often seen as the template uh, when uh, 6,000 Danish Jews were uh, managed to be transported across the Straits to Sweden in the fall of 1943 uh, to escape uh, Nazi deportation. Uh, perhaps uh, less attention uh, is paid to the remarkable story of Italy, which though an ally of Hitler uh, in many occupied areas of Europe protected not only Italian Jews, protected foreign Jews, protected Greek Jews, Yugoslav Jews, uh, until uh, Mussolini was overthrown and Italy was driven out of the war. But that window uh, of protection until uh, the fall of 43 uh, certainly uh, allowed many Jews to survive that would not have. A third area are looking at various organizations or communes uh, that engaged in rescue. 
organizations like Zagoda in Poland or Varian Fry's American Rescue Committee or towns. And here Le Chambon is perhaps the, uh, the template of a town that became a rescue center in which the ethos of the town, uh, the spirit of the town led them uh, to work together to provide haven a rescue for those in danger. And finally, there's of course individual rescue. Uh, these are people often just on their own, someone knocks on the door, asks for help, uh, they hide individuals, they do this uh, without uh, outside connections, without uh, institutional support. Uh, and of course, uh, often the most remarkable stories of uh, Holocaust rescue come uh, from those that acted in this altruistic way. So now I want to talk about someone who in a sense covers has, has in a sense includes three of those groups. Someone who is an individual that certainly went well beyond uh, what one could expect, uh, but was uh, enabled to be a important individual rescuer because of his contacts both with the village of Le Chambon and with rescue organizations in Vichy France, Southern France, uh, that gave him access to the internment camps, particularly Gorge and Result. And this is Tracy Strong Jr., a 26 year old American. Uh, and uh, part of the importance of the story, I think, is, you know, how does a 26-year-old American living in Geneva, Switzerland, become a Holocaust rescuer? Uh, one question that isn't a mystery is his motivation. Uh, when one reads through uh, his diaries and his letters, which I have done, uh, he, he finds it very simple. He thinks the purpose of life is to help others. Uh, he is a helping person. That's just simply who he was. Uh, in that sense, this didn't require transforming his values or becoming something new. Uh, throughout his life, he was a helping person. And for several years in the 1940s, uh, this manifested itself uh, in his uh, opportunities that he sees to become a Holocaust rescuer. More important or more interesting, more challenging for the historian is sense what he did and how he was able to do it. How does a 26-year-old American in Geneva, Switzerland, rescue Jews in Southern France? Uh, and so part of this story will focus on the how uh, rather than the why. Uh, the why is very straightforward. Uh, the how, I think, is much more complex. So who is Tracy Strong Jr.? Uh, he was born in Seattle, Washington in 1915. Uh, his grandfather was a Protestant pastor in the city of Seattle. Uh, who lost his church uh, in, uh, was in a sense driven out of his church uh, in World War I because he was a pacifist and would not go along with supporting America's entry into the war. Uh, here we have a photo of Tracy Strong during the war. You can see a very young man at that time. Uh, Tracy Strong's aunt was a famous figure in Seattle history, Seattle's most famous radical feminist. Uh, she was elected to the Board of Education in Seattle in 1916 and engaged in many progressive activities there. She supported uh, the strike of mill workers in nearby Everett, Washington, that were sponsored by the International Workers of the World, the Wobblies. And then in 1919, supported the general strike in Seattle, which led to a recall election and she was removed from her post in Seattle. Uh, she became dissatisfied enough with what she considered the reactionary American situation uh, that she moved uh, to the Soviet Union, where she lived until the late 40s, deciding that Stalinist Russia was too conservative. She moved to Mao's China and died in Beijing in 1970. Uh, indeed, a very radical uh, woman uh, in Seattle history. So Tracy Strong did not grow up in a normal average American family. His father, uh, in fact, decided to leave the United States and take up a position working for the International YMCA uh, in Geneva. And so in 1923, when Tracy's just eight years old, uh, the family uh, takes a trip across the Pacific, around through Asia, across the Middle East, and arrives in Geneva, uh, where his father becomes the director for the youth division of the International YMCA. And Tracy grows up attending French speaking schools in Geneva, except for three years. Two years he returns to the United States to go to uh, school in the United States to make sure he can uh, function in 
you know, educated in English. And one year, 1932 to 33, is a year he spends in school in Germany. His parents send them into him there intentionally uh, to, so he can master German as well. Uh, and of course, that's the year that Hitler comes to power. In the summer of 1933, as a uh, you know, very young man, he bicycled 2,000 kilometers around uh, Germany in the summer after it had been taken over by the Nazis. He returns to the States in 1933 and goes to college from 33 to 37 to Oberlin College. Truth in Advertising, Oberlin College is also my alma mater. I had no idea when I began this study uh, that we would both have a Northwest connection uh, and an Oberlin College connection, but uh, that is part of the, the irony uh, that came out of all of this. Oberlin was very welcoming to foreign students and to American students from, from abroad. It had a very strong international component. So Tracy Strong felt very welcome there. And then from 1937 to 1940, he attended the Divinity School at Yale. Uh, when he finished, uh, he did not want to become an ordained pastor. He did not want to spend his life as a church minister, whether his grandfather's uh, bad experience uh, earlier was a part of that, I don't know. But in any sense, he wanted to return to Europe. Remember, this is 1940. He applied for a job, for jobs in Switzerland and was eventually uh, offered a job with the European Student Relief Fund. Uh, this was an ecumenical group uh, composed of Catholic, Protestant, and secular groups that was, took on the, the self-appointed task to kind of make sure there was not another lost generation of people in their late teens, early 20s, the college age generation uh, in World War II as there had been in World War I. So he crosses the Atlantic on a boat to Lisbon, Portugal. Portugal was neutral. Travels to France, arrives at the French border in June of 1940, just as the German army arrived at the border. Uh, he had to wait a few weeks till rail transport was, uh, was completed. Uh, takes the train across to Switzerland. And then uh, has a very interesting first job. The International Red Cross by the Hague Convention was authorized to, in a sense, subcontract various groups to represent it in prisoner of war camps. And Tracy volunteered to go to Germany uh, under this auspices. So working for the International Red Cross, uh, he goes to central Germany, Kassel, uh, and is assigned to basically a number of different POW camps, most of them holding French prisoners, some Belgian and English POWs with the task of trying to help the prisoners to organize educational, cultural activities, to persuade German commandants that their job will be easier if they make the life of their prisoners less unpleasant. Uh, and so he learns how to negotiate with Nazi commandants uh, and uh, how to operate uh, in an atmosphere where he has to very strictly follow the law. He assumes their Gestapo around every corner uh, and that he has to be utterly careful about what he is doing. And this occupies him through the fall of 1940 until the Germans then ban him from further entry into the POW camps and he returns to Switzerland in the spring of 1941. At that point, uh, Vichy France, the southern part of France that was not occupied by the Germans but had its own puppet government under Marshal Pétain, has set up a series of internment camps in the south uh, that in the in the interwar period, France had been one of the most generous recipients of refugees in the post-World War I period. But by 1938-39, uh, when the Germans occupied Austria and uh, the Czech territories, the last flood of refugees, France reached that point where they said, we're satiated, we can't take anymore. And then in the spring of 1939, Franco's armies conquered Catalonia, Barcelona, and 400,000 Spanish refugees swarmed over the Pyrenees into southern France. And the response of the French was to build a series of internment camps uh, to put the Spanish refugees uh, in them uh, because they didn't want them running all over the country uh, without anybody sort of keeping track of them. So the origins of these camps were not built for Jewish refugees from Central Europe, but built for Spanish refugees from Franco's Spain. Most of those refugees were able eventually to get out, to either emigrate abroad uh, or find jobs and positions in France or deciding to return to Spain. 
Uh, but when the Nazis invade France in 1940, and there is a second flood of refugees, this time a large number of Central European Jews fleeing from Belgium, Holland, Northern France into Southern France. And the Germans in turn round up the Jews of Alsace and expel them in mass and even round up the Jews of Baden and Falls. These are German Jews within German boundaries and put them on trains, 10,000 German Jews and expel them to Southern France. Uh, the Vichy government uh, then reopened these camps or didn't reopen them, they simply now repurposed them. Uh, and uh, alongside the remaining Spanish refugees that are still in them, they are now flooded with Central European Jewish refugees uh, that are, in a sense, the second generation of internees in these camps. Uh, the uh, YMCA in France, under a man named Donald Lowry, working with other relief groups that were trying to help the refugees in these camps, put out the call for volunteers to come to these camps uh, and uh, to try to make life better. And since uh, you know, Tracy Strong was one of those rare Americans that spoke German and French as well as English. Uh, he now volunteered and went to Southern France. Uh, and uh, it turned out that he came very much at the center now of the humanitarian relief effort in these camps. Because two things happened in the fall of, of 1941 or actually in the fall of 1940, spring of 1941. One is the international press covering these camps basically reported how terrible the conditions were and the Vichy government was quite embarrassed and decided it had to do something to improve its image. Uh, and so it agreed that relief organizations could come into the camps and even agreed uh, and in fact asked them to organize a central committee between these 29 relief organizations that now began to arrive uh, to coordinate a division of labor so they didn't duplicate each other. And this became the so-called Nimes Committee. And the man in charge, the chairman, was Don Lowry of the YMCA. And he asked uh, young Tracy Strong to be his secretary. So he was the secretary of this 29 institution group trying to organize the most efficient way to bring relief into these camps in southern France. The second thing that happened was that the Vichy government agreed that the more people that could get out of the camps, the better. So that if one could find a job or find a sponsor outside the camp, they could leave. Uh, particularly for children, if groups that would sponsor children's homes and orphanages uh, and provide places for people to leave, they could leave. So you couldn't walk out of the camp on your own, but if somebody came and said, we will take responsibility for them, then you could be released into the hands of some group, some institution, uh, and uh, the French were glad to reduce the number of people in the camps uh, because of the, their desire to improve conditions enough that they would not have such a bad reputation for the terrible condition in these camps that had spread through the international press. So Tracy Strong is working out of Geneva. He's also working out of Marseille where uh, the YMCA is headquartered in Southern France. He's working out of Nimes where the committee meets periodically. And he's traveling from place to place in Southern France. There were 49 different camps on his list. The most important of which were Gourves and Result. Uh, Gores uh, at the west end of the Pyrenees, Result at the east end of the Pyrenees were the two biggest of these internment camps and where he spent uh, the most of his time because that's where the largest numbers were. And his particular task was try to improve the cultural educational life of people there. He brought musical instruments into the camp so they could have concerts and, and that. He brought in uh, materials for uh, uh, writing for people who wanted to, to right uh, and uh, he brought in other kinds of entertainment procured a movie projector that would move from camp to camp so every month they would see a new movie in each of these camps as this itinerant movie projector would make its way around so his particular task was to try to make life a little less unpleasant less boring in these camps uh, over the course of 1941 into 1942, he became increasingly discouraged. And like many humanitarian relief workers, he experienced what we would now call burnout. Uh, the, re the increasing realization of the futility of what he was doing. 
Uh, particularly in the winter of 41, 42, uh, food became very scarce. Uh, there was great hunger in the camps, even starvation. Uh, and uh, he found that trying to get people to come to language classes or to attend concerts when they could hardly stand up for malnutrition uh, was just uh, a very futile prospect. Uh, let me quote from one of his, of his letters. I see clearly the importance of giving an intellectual and spiritual aid in the camps, but it's quite another thing to accomplish this when you have someone in front of you who is liable to faint any minute because of malnourishment. Uh, and he characterized his attempt to set up cultural activities in these camps as, quote, growing roses on barbed wire. Uh, and so uh, he was becoming increasingly aware that what he was doing really uh, was a kind of putting a Band-Aid on a hemorrhage. It just was not working. Uh, and he was also experiencing great physical uh, debility, really. The very job of coming into France, traveling around, uh, was absolutely exhausting. Uh, there were very few trains. He learned to sleep three hours a night sitting on his suitcase in the aisle of a rare train that he could catch a ride on. Uh, living off uh, the ration books he got without the chance to work with the black market because you weren't local and didn't know who to contact. Uh, he would leave Geneva and within three weeks he would lose about 12 pounds. And then after a month, he'd have to go back to Geneva, as he said, to fill up and regain his lost weight uh, before he could uh, return to France again. Uh, so it was a physically exhausting as well as a psychologically exhausting task that he had taken on. Nonetheless, in December 1941, when he had an obvious chance to leave, uh, he did not. In 1940, December 41, of course, Germany declared war on the United States after Japan had attacked at Pearl Harbor. It was not clear whether Vichy France would follow Germany in declaring war on the US, uh, and he was advised to leave. And he said, no, I will stay, uh, realizing that, of course, if war was declared, as he put it, I will soon be on the inside of the internment camps instead of on the outside, that he was risking uh, that, that he would lose his freedom and that he would be interned as an enemy alien if Vichy France declared war. They didn't, then he was able to continue, but he didn't know it at the time and was well aware of the risk that he was running. But most important for Tracy at this point uh, was the decision to reorient what he was trying to accomplish. Uh, and over the course of the winter of 41, 42, uh, particularly in the fall of 41, he made the decision that it was far more important to get people out of the camps rather than to improve their life in the camps. Uh, and this is when he began to make his connection with Le Chambon. And he did it through his Swiss connections. Uh, the Protestant, yeah, Le Chambon was a, 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 a Protestant village in the Midi. This is a mountainous rural area. Uh, and the uh, head of the Protestant or Huguenot congregation there was a man named Andre Trachma. And when Andre Trachma had heard of the terrible conditions of the camps and the internment camps, he had gone to the head of the Quaker Relief Group, the American Friends Service Committee, uh, and asked if he could volunteer to work in the camps. And the head of the Quaker Rescue, uh, Relief Committee had said, no, much more important would be if you would use your influence in Le Chambon to welcome people to come out of the camps. Uh, and in fact, they connected with a Swiss group, the Swiss Child's Aid Group, to finance the renting of a hotel in Le Chambon. Le Chambon operated before the war often as a kind of summer vacation area, high up in the mountains. It was cooler. People who wanted to come there also for sanitarium reasons, clean air. They had a, a fair tourist industry in the town and, and various housing of pensions, pensions and, and hotels that now during the war, of course, were unused. So the Le Chambon arranged for the first uh, haven, the first child's home through the Swiss, uh, funded by the Swiss uh, Child's Aid Society uh, in 1941. And uh, Tracy heard of this through another connection in Switzerland, a man named uh, Charles Guillon. Charles Guillon had been Trachme's predecessor as the pastor in Le Chambon, had then become its mayor and then resigned as mayor in June 1940 because he wouldn't take an oath to uh, the Vichy government, uh, but had strong connections in Switzerland uh, and uh, knew Tracy's father. And so really through that connection, 
Tracy heard of Le Chambon, travels to Le Chambon in October 41, uh, meets Trocme. Trocme drives him around till they find a, a building that they can rent, which was called La Maison des Roches. Uh, and uh, that uh, he could get uh, funding from the Americans this time uh, to rent this building. And now the task is to get both the French authorities in the department of Le Chambon to agree to take Jewish refugees uh, out of the camps and to, of course, go to the camps and agree to get the commandants to release the Jewish refugees. What we see here is a picture of the patio on the front of La Maison de Moche, the Maison des Roches. Uh, it's on the outskirts of Le Chambon, uh, where you can visit today. There's a teeny, teeny little plaque in the bushes, but otherwise it is not marked in any way. But Tracy, through Guillon, is put in contact with a man named Robert Bach, who is the department, the, the prefect, the prefect. Uh, and he agrees that uh, he will allow refugees to come in if they are put up in the Maison des Roches and paid for by others, so they have a sponsor. And in this case, the cover is they're not children. Uh, they're not adults with a job. They're not children cared for in a child's home. They're gonna be college age students and this is gonna become a school. So it's gonna be the, the cover, the legal category in which these people will be brought out of the camps into Le Chambon is to attend school, which will be organized at the Maison des Roches. Tracy then goes to the camps, negotiates with commandants and begins to get people uh, released from the camps. So starting in February, you have a trickle of young men, these are people in their late teens, early twenties, being released from Reeves Alt and Gores, coming to Le Chambon uh, and uh, a small faculty is hired uh, that they are- Hello? Uh, I'll suck this bloody call up. Sorry, Chris, can you unmute yourself? We had a problem, sorry. Okay, am I back on? Okay, uh, so Tracy uh, begins to select people out of the camps and bring them uh, to, uh, to Le Chambon uh, where they are registered as students resident in the Maison des Roches. Uh, by late spring, uh, he has 30, some, 30 students there, 21 of them are Jewish, others are Spanish refugees, but the bulk are Jews from Central Europe. Uh, and that uh, they attend class and they also uh, do work for the local farmers who are helping to feed them. So it is a, a, a kind of very clever arrangement that he works out uh, where these people are embedded into Le Chambon society. Uh, in the summer of 1942, Tracy goes back to Switzerland. Uh, that some of the other volunteers for the committees he's been on uh, have left and he is tied up in a sense with administrative work in July and August in Geneva. But it is in late July, early August that he begins to hear about the catastrophe that is taking place in France. Uh, and this is the beginning of the deportations. Now, the Vichy government up until the summer of 1940 had been very resentful and uh, about the Jewish refugees being driven into the South, turning the South into kind of a demographic dumping ground for people the Germans did not want. And above all, the actual uh, shipping to Southern France of German Jews from Baden and Falls, from the Rhineland. And they kept complaining to the Germans that the Armistice Commission where the two negotiated, won't you take these people back? Uh, and the Germans, of course, kept saying no. And then suddenly in June of 1942, the French, instead of pushing on a closed door when they came and said, won't you take these people back, found that they were pushing on an open door. And the Germans said, we will not only take these people back, we will take all 150,000 foreign Jews in France. And uh, as long as you give us the 150,000 foreign Jews, we will then take all the 150,000 French Jews. Uh, and the Vichy government agrees. 
uh, and not only agrees to that, they will use the French police to round these people up. They will use the French bureaucratic card files to keep track of where they live so they can be caught. And they agree uh, that part of the quotas will be met in 1942 by 10,000 Jews from the unoccupied zone. This is a territory where there are no Germans. That the French will take Jews in southern France, bring them to Paris, uh, to the uh, uh, transit camp, uh, and uh, then turn them over to the Germans for deportation into the Third Reich, which of course we now know were trains to Auschwitz. Uh, so this is the agreement that is reached in June of 42 between Vichy government and the Germans. The roundups begin in the north of France in mid-July. Uh, and then uh, the Vichy government begins to fill the 10,000 quota by first taking people out of the internment camps uh, and then taking the lists of people they released from the camps and where they live. So on August 26th, uh, the French police arrive in Le Chambon to round up the Jews that are there, following what Tracy had done with the second house, safe house in Le Chambon, a number of other agencies had done the same thing. So Le Chambon is filled with a number of houses that are filled with Jewish refugees. Uh, and the Germans have basically know where they are because they, the French prefects have agreed and have the list of the people that have gone there, so I'm sorry, it's not the Germans, the French know who is there, and come back on August 26 to get them. Fortunately, somebody, probably the prefect Robert Bach, or at least somebody in his office, warned Le Chambon ahead of time. And when the Vichy police arrived with tons, with a whole caravan of buses to load people onto, there is no Jew in Le Chambon to be found. They have all the dispersed into the countryside, hidden by local farmers, who they have been working for over the summer. And uh, the Vichy police come up uh, totally empty handed. And they wait there three weeks and finally realizing that nobody's going to betray the Jews, no one's going to turn Jews in, uh, they finally trundle off uh, and go away. Uh, in the meantime, the Jews that have been hidden in the countryside, the move is to move them from France and smuggle them over the border into Switzerland. And there is a big wave then, of course, of French Jews fleeing and, and foreign Jews fleeing France into Switzerland in August and in early September. Uh, and of the 21 Jews who had been at La Maison des Roches, all of whom were hidden, 16 get across the border. Uh, but then, unfortunately, and, 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 and Tracy Strong, in fact, meets them when they come across the border, uh, arranges for their papers with the Swiss, uh, helps them in getting settled in Switzerland uh, in, in August, and then uh, realizes uh, that, uh, that not all of them have made it. And it turns out that on September 27th, 26th, uh, the Swiss reverse their policy, feeling they too are now being overwhelmed and saturated, uh, reverse their open border, and seal it. And so Jews who try to come in thereafter, if they're caught, are sent back into the arms of the Vichy police. This is, of course, what happened to the parents of Charles Friedlander. If you've read his just extraordinary memoir, uh, that his parents tried to cross into Switzerland uh, and were turned back and sent to Auschwitz. Uh, the last five Jews that had been the Maison des Roches are caught by the Swiss police, turned over to the French police, put in handcuffs, and sent all the way across back to Rivesalt, where they had started in February uh, earlier before Tracy Strong had gotten them out. Tracy has been seeing this from the Swiss side, helping people who are coming in, and then decides in September he must go back into France and to see if there's anything to be done. Uh, his first trip into France in, in September, uh, nothing can be done. He can't get any more people out of the camps. Uh, and uh, he realizes what, uh, at this point, just how desperate the situation uh, is, is becoming. Uh, this is when he also learns, in fact, about Auschwitz and not the whole extent of the Holocaust in Europe, but at least about the fate of those who were departed. And let me quote uh, from his letter writing back to his parents after his first trip to France in September of 42. Uh, he writes, I don't think I can exaggerate the deportation of the Jews. 
it is hard to see some of your good friends put on boxcars and sent away without being able to raise a hand to help them at all. I've been able to stay with them to the last minute, but that doesn't change anything. I'm really becoming to believe in, de sorry, uh, <clears throat> in demonic forces that are greater than any one person or group of people. In no place do decisions become far reaching, really matters of life and death. He does at this point realize uh, that the fate of the, of the deportees uh, is death itself. Uh, he decides he goes back to Switzerland at the end of September and then decides he will go into France again in October of 1942. Uh, he arrives at Rivesalt exactly when his five Jews from the Maison des Roches have been captured on the French border and are sent back to Rivesalt. Uh, and this time he finds a way uh, to spring them. Uh, he was working with a French Protestant relief group called Simad. And Simad apparently had some connection with the Swiss diplomatic corps and was able to get Swiss visas for these five Jews. And Tracy then was able to negotiate, even though this was against Vichy policy, for their release from Rivesalt and a safe conduct pass to travel across France from Rivesalt to the town of Anamas, a French town on the Swiss border, where there was a Swiss consulate where they could pick up the visas that Simad had procured, procured for them. So they had papers that released them from the camp and safe conduct passes to travel through France that Tracy had gotten them and uh, visas from Switzerland waiting for them that Simad had gotten them. Uh, and they are released from result in early November. Tracy, once he has procured this, jumps, jumps the train for Switzerland, crosses from France uh, to Switzerland on November 6th. And this, you must remember, is exactly when the American army is invading Vichy France colonial territory, Algeria uh, in North Africa. Uh, and there's a shooting war between Vichy France and the Americans briefly. And Tracy crosses the border into Switzerland one hour before the border is closed for Americans and he would have been arrested and interned as an enemy alien. So he gets out of France by the skin of his teeth uh, the people he's gotten out of result get to Anamas just as the German army is moving into unoccupied France. So the German army and the five young Jews arrive in Anamas at the same time. Unfortunately, it's a Friday afternoon, so the French, the Swiss consulate is going to be closed for the entire weekend. But they are hidden in Anamas over the weekend. Uh, uh, they get their visa uh, Monday morning. And they're able to illegally leave France through the garden of a monastery that backs up on the Swiss border. They leave France illegally. They're immediately encountered by the Swiss police, but they enter Switzerland legally because they now have visas. And Tracy Strong meets them at the train station in Geneva. It takes them to his apartment, uh, gives them pastries and hot chocolate. Uh, so he did spring the last five of the 21 Jews that had been at Maison de Roche. Uh, you know, by the narrowest of margins. Uh, Tracy is then trapped in Geneva thereafter because there's no neutral territory. He spends up until 44 uh, basically in, uh, in, in Geneva, unable to engage in other activities, certainly not in France. And then in 44 volunteers, uh, when the border opens, uh, goes to London and volunteers for the American army and ends up in Berlin uh, in 1945, uh, where what does he do? Uh, sets up a program for rescuing German youth in the chaos of collapsed and bombed out Berlin. Uh, you know, once again, an example of, of oh, who he was. Uh, I think that the story is important, I think, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, of course, it shows us what a enterprising person uh, who wanted to do the most he could do, uh, uh, what they were capable of doing. Uh, but it also sheds light on two, in a sense, on, on two wider problems, or two wider, I should say, historical controversies. Uh, one is what is often referred to as the memory wars over Pastor Trachme and Le Chambon. And the second is the so-called French paradox. How was it that France, with an anti-Semitic Vichy regime working with the Germans, 
Uh, nonetheless, 75% of French Jews survive and only 25% of French Jews are lost. Why is the casualty rate in France so much lower than in say the Netherlands uh, when you had a cooperating collaborating regime? And the Tracy Song story, I think, sheds light on both of those issues, which is what I would, would close with now. Uh, first, the memory war over Le Chambon. Uh, the events in Le Chambon were relatively unknown until uh, a man named Philip Hollier, a professor of philosophy at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, uh, encountered the papers that Trochme had left in the Swarthmore archive uh, for reasons that are not quite clear. Uh, and uh, then wrote a book called Let Less Innocent Blood Be Shed. And um, Philip Hollier was a believer in nonviolence. Trochme had engaged in nonviolent resistance as a kind of exemplary figure, uh, had, be, uh, had toured the United States after the war, preaching this as a kind of example of successful nonviolence. But it really is with Philip Hollier's book that he suddenly becomes kind of a Holocaust rescue hero. Uh, and Le Chambon now is elevated. People are aware of, of this extraordinary town uh, and uh, much more of, of, of Troc May. Uh, but at the same time in France, this led to some resentment and jealousy uh, that Le Chambon, what, the, what, they, what was referred to as the Chambonization of rescue in the Midi in this general area. Uh, and uh, the sanctification of Trachme at the expense of many other people who had engaged in ref rescue as well. Because the whole region had in fact been receptive to Jews, no other town, I would insist on this, unless people know something that I don't, no other town actually opened whole buildings to house refugees and then went out and proactively recruited refugees to come and fill them. These aren't just people that let refugees come, these are people that went out and <laughs> hunted for refugees to, to help and, and place them there. Uh, they more or less reached an agreement with the local French resistance that they would not have fighting in this area uh, so that this nonviolent resistance would not attract German worry. And the Germans adopted a kind of live and let live to the extent that the Germans came and requisitioned three hotels for wounded German soldiers to recover. So you're in the same town, you had three hotels filled with wounded Germans, side by side with hotels filled with Jewish refugees and everybody lived and let live. Uh, so uh, this was a area where nonviolence was kind of the agreed upon ceasefire uh, and this could all go on. Uh, some in the French resistance who engaged in life risking physical resistance elsewhere thought that they weren't getting enough attention and others in the region thought that Le Chambon was getting too much attention. And so there were some hard feelings until a whole conference was held in Le Chambon in 1990. Everybody got to come and tell their story. And uh, people realized that this is not a zero sum game. You know, the more rescuers and the more people that help, the better. Uh, we wanna know about all of these stories and they all basically came out and subsequent French scholarship has very much embraced a wider story at which Le Chambon and Trochme are at the center, but uh, there are many other uh, worthy uh, helpers that made all of this possible. Uh, sometime later, an English-speaking author, uh, uh, Carolyn Moorhead, uh, wrote a book called The Village of Secrets. Uh, and in The Village of Secrets, uh, she basically has her publisher claim she was going to tell for the first time uh, the true story of Le Chambon and that she's going to engage in what she referred to as myth busting. And so she engaged in basically saying Trochme and nonviolence were a small part of this story, uh, that all the other rescues and particularly female rescuers and non-Protestant rescuers and all the list of, it reads like a 19, you know, 2015 diversity list, not a 1940s who's who list. Uh, and uh, that basically, uh, again, sort of accused uh, those who had written about Le Chambon up to this time of neglecting X, Y, and Z. And uh, she uh, attacked Philip Hollier very fiercely. And she also attacked Pierre Sauvage. Now, Pierre Sauvage was born in Le Chambon to Jewish refugees in 1944. And in the 1980s released a remarkable documentary film called Weapons of the Spirit, uh, in which in fact he interviewed for the first time many of the women who were rescuers 
uh, had them on camera, and apparently Carolyn Moore had no Moore had no problem both blaming Holliday and Savage for not paying attention to women, women, women rescuers while quoting the the interviews of the women rescuers in Pierre Savage's film, uh, which is a which is I guess we would say chutzpah of the nth degree, uh, certainly hypocrisy of the nth degree. In any case, uh, <clears throat> the, the problem here was, of course, almost all of the story of Le Chambon was based upon post-war testimony. And so it was now claimed this was all a post-war invention. This was all inflated. The importance of Tracy Strong's diary and letters as they were written in 1942, 41, fall of 41, when he goes there. And it's absolutely clear that Trock May and the Huguenot Committee were, were pivotal to this. They're there that helped get it started. It gains momentum. Many other people come in. But the notion that Trock May and the Huguenot community uh, were some post-war PR invention that has blown their role out of all proportion is simply false. And the papers of Tracy Strong and his story uh, with contemporary documentation uh, prove that, to my opinion, beyond any doubt. So rescuing uh, Le Chambon and Trocme from uh, the myth busting uh, of Carolyn Moorhead is one historical issue that I think is important in this story. The second is the paradox. How do we explain why in France 75% of Jews survive? Uh, here we can see that uh, one, you had a period in which VC France has no German occupiers but not only has no German occupiers, has 29 international rescue groups, Jewish and non-Jewish, French and non-French, all operating, creating organizations and institutions and patterns of behavior that when the deportations begin, they already have in place a rescue mechanism. They didn't have to start from scratch, uh, that uh, they know how to people, you know, to, to get people uh, out of the board of the into safe houses, they know how to get people over the border, they know who they can trust, how you move people from one area to another. So it was, I would argue, one unique feature of Southern France, unlike any other region of the Nazi occupation, is that you had this network of rescue groups ready to shift from legal to illegal activity and from relief to rescue. Uh, certainly, uh, Tracy Strong was ahead of that in terms of shift from relief to rescue and, and what when setting up uh, the safe house to begin with, but you had people and processes already in place that could be mobilized instantly. So that the German capacity to capture Jews in Southern France uh, was far reduced, uh, much less than say in the Netherlands uh, or other countries where they may not have had a collaborating government, but the Jews were trapped and could be rounded up and, and, and taken fairly easily. In Southern France, that proved to be a much more difficult task. So we certainly know that you know, dictatorships, uh, persecuting regimes fear dissident individuals, but for them, the real challenge is people working in concert. And when you have people able to work in organizations, when you have not only individuals like Tracy Strong, but working in the network of villages like Le Chambon, working with the networks like the YMCA, the American Friends Service, CIMAD, uh, that, uh, that regimes can be really effectively challenged. And that I think is one of the key lessons uh, of the Tracy Strong story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Browning, for a very, very thought-provoking storytelling session and analysis. Highly appreciated. Um, I'm now going to introduce you to Fredson Gelengi from the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, who will say uh, some words in closing and some words of thanks. Thank you very much, Fredson. Over to you. And after Fredson, we will have a last two pieces of music from Beit David. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tali. Uh, my name is Fredson Gilang. I am a program manager with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And uh, for us is 
a great honor to be part of this process of which uh, we have been uh, for some, I would say for many years now, working in a great cooperation with the, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, with the Goethe Institute, with the German Foundation and others. And why do we do that? Because in our program for this particular region, but also inspired in the work that we do globally as a foundation to build a peaceful democratic society. History, remembrance and anti-discrimination play a central role. And the years go, as the years go on, we have more and more proofs of the need of taking history more seriously. In our region particular, particularly, I would mention maybe two reasons why we engage in events or initiatives such as this one. One, because the history of our region has been shaped by extreme violence. Just to give two examples, the Herero and Nama genocide took place in this region, just here in Namibia. The other one is the apartheid. Apartheid was extremely violent and also shaped the South African society and still shapes, and we can still feel today the impact of, of apartheid in our society as a form of extreme violence. The second is that even today, as we, we gather here and we reflect, we still under the threat of extreme forms of violence. One, is xenophobia something that a, a, a theme that the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center has also ded been dedicating effort into uh, uh, studying and reflecting about? The other one is just here: what's happening in Mozambique, terrorism. So these are just two uh, examples of extreme events happening in our region that drives us as the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in partnership with uh, 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 organizations like as, such as the Johannesburg and Holocaust and Genocide Center, Center and others to conduct reflections like this. Because at the end of the day, what we want is to use, to bring the past to the present in order for these events, like we say, at the beginning, not to happen again. So I would like, in the name of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and also in the name of the organizers of this event, to thank you, uh, Professor Browning, for accepting our invitation and for joining us. This is, I, I need to maybe stress, is the most important event that we organize yearly as part of this cooperation with the Rosa, uh, uh, Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, the Goat Institute and the German Embassy. So thank you very much. And I would also like to appreciate everyone that uh, was involved in the preparation of this. Tali, thank you very much. Thank you, your team as well. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And thank you, the um, uh, people at the Goat Institute and everybody that today joined us to attend this event. That was actually for the very first time, at least in my life, in my poor knowledge of the history of the Holocaust, we uh, were introduced to a, a positive a, 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 a story of someone who actually tried to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, do positive things. We, we get very little uh, stories of positive um, uh, uh, behaviors 
uh, in the context of uh, the, 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 the Holocaust. So once again, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Fredson. Um, and from my side and from the side of the Goethe Institute, also thank you to all of you who were here this evening and were part of this very special commemoration. Um, as I said, we uh, close the event now with two last piece of music by the choir of Bay David. Good evening and please be safe. <laughs>
you are muted. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. I was saying thank you to the Bet David Choir based in Santon, Johannesburg. Thank you very much for that music, that moving, wonderful music. Thank you very much. Thank you to His Excellency Ambassador Andreas Peschka, Ambassador of the Republic of Germany um, in South Africa. Thank you very much for your for joining us and, and for your words. Thank you very much to our keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Browning, for that excellent really inspiring presentation. I really want to echo Fredson's words that we are so great. It's so nice to have a positive, inspiring story from, from this atrocity. So thank you very much for gracing us with your presence uh, this evening. Thank you very much. And hopefully maybe next year, we will be able to see you in person in real life so hopefully <laughs> thank you very much thank you to the south african holocaust and genocide foundation and the three directors of the three centers thank you to talinate director of the johannesburg holocaust and genocide center thank you to mary Gluck, director of the durban holocaust and genocide center and thank you to heather blumenthal director of the of the cape town holocaust and genocide center uh, thank you also to the rosa luxemburg foundation for your continued support thank you to Fredson Guilengue. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. Thank you to the Bet David Choir for your music and for your inspiration. And thank you to the Goethe Institute for your partnership, for your continued partnership. We really value your partnership. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you to our Master of Ceremony tonight, Mr. Francois Fenter. Thank you very much for your mastery in, mod in moderating tonight's um, conversation and presentation and event. Thank you. I wish you all health, good health, and all the best until we meet again next year. Hopefully, it will be under the same roof next year. Uh, farewell until then. Good night and be safe. Thank you.